Hello friends! Today we're going to build Edward's Fokker DR1 in 172 scale. Let's go! Right off the bat, Edward Profi Packs are great because they come with photo etch parts and masks. So with a little skill and some patience, you can build a very well detailed model with just the contents of the box. The kit comes with a lot of photo etch parts to detail the cockpit. That does require the removal of the molded in cockpit details, and I struggle to find the right tool to cut it out. For a wood grain texture, I like to lay down a tan base color. Here, I'm using wood deck tan, and then I use a coarse brush to spread a darker brown oil paint on top to mimic the lines of a wood grain. My favorite is burnt sienna. I do a similar method for propellers, but I like to freehand paint one or more brown lines to mimic the laminated layers before adding the oil paint on top.
The oil paints take forever to dry, and when they do, you need to protect them with a clear coat. Be especially careful with the PE parts for the cockpit. I carefully masked my wood pattern. I think it's cool that the plywood triangle is visible in the cockpit since it was an important part of the DR1's construction and it creates something interesting to notice in the cockpit. One problem with PE parts is that they're flat. In 172 scale, it's usually not a big deal, but I wanted this pump to be 3D, so I bolted it up with some tacky glue. Were I to do it again, I'd do several thinner layers of the glue to avoid that weird divot. As it is though, it's really not that noticeable, but the fact that it's rounded now is. So I really ought to have been more conscientious as I built the pilot seat. I should have used fresh super glue, I should have primed the PE parts, I should have removed paint at glue contact points, but I didn't and the pilot seat gave me a bunch of trouble. You get to upgrade the machine guns with photo etch parts. It looks great, but I followed the instructions. Were I to do it again, I'd get a needle or some other mini tube to replicate the gun barrel. I didn't have a cylinder small enough to help roll up the PE mesh, so I made one with a stretch sprue.
I finally got the pilot seat to behave. It's nice to have little victories. Everything went together pretty easily. It was nice that there was a huge hole above the cockpit so you could make adjustments if needed. The wings needed a bit of cleanup. There wasn't a huge amount on each wing, but keep in mind, there are three of them after all. I decided to follow the directions and attach the little elevator doodads now. Don't do that. Wait until you're done with everything else, and then put them on, or you'll be searching for microscopic photo etch parts for hours. Despite the nice fit, I found on my kit that the seams took quite a bit of work to hide. I masked off the cockpit and got ready for the fun part. Okay, actually this was super tedious. I tried to do the paint option for a pilot named Vice, and wouldn't you know it, he painted a lot of white on his plane. So I wanted to do some pronounced pre-shading to replicate the translucence of white painted doped canvas. 
My decision to mask the tiny little lines took forever. There has to be a better way to do this. Seriously, if anyone has a suggestion or a tip or anything to get a similar effect without the mind-numbing tedium, please let me know in the comments. Finally, a little payoff with a few seconds of airbrushing. I like to use cheap crappy paint brushes to stir the pot on my airbrush. They mix well, and they can help clean up too when you're done. It's probably wrong and bad, but it works for me. If you're painting white or any light color, an airbrush is definitely worth it. I did an experiment for my model building class once, and it took me seven coats of white to paint with a brush to get sufficient coverage. And since I had the airbrush out, I decided to knock out some other pieces that would need it. There's always more to be masked. So, when these DR1s weren't completely covered in paint schemes mimicking tropical birds and heat, they had Fokker streaking which was actually a peculiar camo pattern to World War I German planes, not a college dare. Anyway, anyway, the instructions said that it began with a blue base, and since the underside of the wing was also supposed to be a light blue, I just did it all over. The next step to Fokker streaking is apparently to streak an olivish green over the light blue, the instructions looked like there was some yellow in there too, so I broke out the oil paints and decided to mix a drabby sort of green and also use a little ochre. I experimented with enamels and acrylics of various brands and colors, and the oil paints were the only ones that gave me the streaky look I was going for. Like an angsty teenager looking out her rain-spattered window at the pines in the distance. Anyway, I just dabbed tiny little dots randomly and then used a flat brush to uh, streak them out. If I were to do it again, I think I'd try for a darker green, or maybe omit, omit the yellow. I like the texture, but I think the shade on mine ended up being too grassy. So the propeller shaft 
didn't fit very well through the engine. I tried to force it, and... Be sure you fit it carefully, and I guess don't force it. Oh well, nothing a little glue can't fix. One of the neat things, but also daunting things about this model is all of the little doodads. There are a bunch you have to work on even before constructing the airframe, and once the airframe is built, there's a bunch more. And of course it turns out, painting the cowling on the sprue was a bad idea. Since there aren't many clear parts in the kit, the only masks are for the wheels. Honestly, wheels aren't that hard to paint freehand, but the masks are nice, so why not use them? One thing I thought was interesting was the wing skids. They go on the end of the bottom wings, you'll see in a minute. I suppose that having such a narrow wingspan and a high profile would make the plane more unstable on the ground, and especially since most aerodromes in World War I were nothing more than pastures. I wonder how many DR1s those wing skids actually save from gopher holes. It's nice to finally get the spandos attached, but one thing I noticed is that this model has very tight tolerances. You have to be very precise to get things just so. One thing I really liked about this model is how the top wing fit on. If you've ever built a biplane, you know that getting the top wing attached is sort of a rite of passage. Edward made it a breeze though, and I didn't really have any issues getting it to sit right down like it wanted to be there. Probably the three wing design helps. Thanks, Mr. Fokker. The landing gear, however, was a bit of a pain. One of my favorite parts of any build is the decals. Edward has never let me down with their decals. They're thin, they seat nicely, and they react well to decal solution. Even with the pre-shading, the white was pretty uniform. I wanted to add a little depth to the white, but I didn't want to overdo it either. So I thinned some ochre oil paint with mineral spirits and did just a tiny bit of color variation, then blended the effect with a flat brush.
I also added just a little oil smear. These World War I machines were lubricated with castor oil, which leaked from the rotary engines in copious amounts. The poor pilots had to endure several hours of castor oil mist every time they went up, and many had to rush to the outhouse straight after landing as a result. In my opinion, rigging is the most important part of adding realism to a model. If you're not into rigging, but want to build a World War I kit, then the DR-1 may be a good fit for you. Because of the triplane design and the advances made by Tony Fokker, rigging wasn't needed as much on the DR-1, which is a good thing since it was already a slowpoke. All you need to do is a few little control wires, one little X for the landing gear, and another above the guns. And with that last touch-up, the model is done. And here is the finished product. I really, really like building these Edward kits. Uh, they're a whole heck of a lot of fun. They're just really neat, and uh, the Profi packs are great because, of course, as I already said, they've got all the, the cool stuff. So if you're interested in building a really well-detailed and really nice little kit, uh, this is a great one to do. So there is that. There's a bunch of things that uh, uh, frustrated me about it, but mostly that's because I'm, I'm an idiot. Like, for example, um, can you see? Uh, focus. Focus on this, not on me. Oh, well, anyway, there's those two dots on the horizontal stabilizer on the top. That's because I glued the horizontal stabilizer uh, on upside down. So a lot of headache can be saved um, when bu building this if you're not a moron. So so there is that. Um, there's a bunch of other little things, you know, that uh, um, was mostly my fault because I just wasn't paying attention or I was maybe rushing or that sort of thing. I put a fingerprint on the uh, uh, Fokker streaking. Oh, right here on the bottom wing, you can see. And so that's annoying. That's something that I'll have to deal with later. I just didn't have the heart to uh, basically fill it in with putty. And then, of course, uh, sand it and all that kind of stuff. Or fix the fingerprint yet. So I'll get to it one day. I think uh, I would like to enter this into a, a model show because I think it's a cool little thing. <laughs> kind of a neat little guy. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the build, um, and uh, of course, I, as always, wish you joy in your lives, and we'll see you again soon.